and welcome to a brand new episode of Happy Mum, Happy Baby, the podcast. I feel like I should start by saying it is the summer holidays. We have started and our kids are here. I have three kids playing in the garden. So if you if you hear some screaming throughout, don't worry, they're fine. Tom is with them. I figured that if any, if, like of all the podcasts, this is one that's fine for kids to be somewhere in the background. Um, but on to today's guest. Uh, she's used to being the one asking the questions. So today it's a bit of a bit of role reversal. Uh, she is the lead host of Women's Hour, uh, which I have to say had me in so much of a, a debate, an internal debate with myself a month ago over the whole knicker debacle. You know, do you or do you not wear knickers to bed? I, before getting into bed, I change my knickknacks, I put them on, I feel fresher and I get into bed. So I am someone who wears knickers. But off the back of this conversation... I was like, no, I'm going to go to bed tonight and I am not going to. Turns out my vagina felt far too exposed. <laughs> so the next night, next night they were back on. Um, but back to today's guest, not just my knickers. Uh, she is also the presenter of Newsnight, author of Period is About Bloody Time and Mother of One. It's Emma Barnett. Hello. Hello. And I have got knickers on right now. <laughs> I promise you. <laughs> I'm ever without them bar in the shower and that's what <laughs> the debate you're referring to actually came out of another podcast with Susanna which many people Susanna Constantine uh, on her wardrobe malfunction podcast and right at the end she just happened to say well of course you wear uh, knickers under your pajamas and just in passing about something else I said of course so she said, of course you don't. And I said, of course you do. And I was so convinced that the women of Britain would be on my side. You know, when you really think what you think is the yeah. norm. And um, not only did I then just pepper it into a chat on Woman's Hour, and of which I was firmly told that I needed to let it air. Uh, I was also questioned if I was a Catholic, because one woman wrote in saying at her nun school, she was told if she died in the night and met God without pants on, he wouldn't think well of her. Um, I, I soon learned, because the Daily Mail splashed it across its pages, yeah. that I'm, you and me, we're in the yeah. majority of being right, in my mind, but the minority <laughs> okay. of what people do what women do so I've tried it like you I've done it twice and it feels too it feels weird so and also I don't like wearing pajamas without knickers on so I have to wear like a t-shirt or like a nighty and but that obviously rides up as you move around which then just means your whole bottoms it just feels weird because also I don't sleep with my legs together it's just it's just a bit weird I can't do it one woman told me she tried without knickers for the first time recently, like you and I, mm. to see if we were wrong. We're not. And um, she had her first sex dream in a long time <sighs> because she realised her brain suddenly felt everything, as you say, was more awake. Oh. There you go. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? She's quite a new mum as well, so make of that what you will. Oh, very interesting. Well, that because if you're wearing knickers, you're almost shutting it off. So it's not just about letting it breathe in the air sense. It's oh, that's very interesting. Um, let's talk about your childhood. Where did you grow up, and what what was it like? I grew up in Manchester, and uh, I had a great time. And I went to an all girls school. I'm an only child. And I, I revealed this recently when I was talking to a group of schoolgirls about the book, and I hadn't thought of it for ages, but I think it's quite funny. I, I was sort of a rebel without cause, but I was always naughty within, within an inch of the rule, so it wasn't right. too bad either. Uh, and I, you know, I did pretty well at school. I had a lot of, I sort of partied hard and worked hard. But I also was nicknamed Commitment Carol because I like to have a full diary, even as a young child. So I had a, a lot of interests as well growing up, you know, whether there were things forced on me like piano playing through to what I loved, which was at the time, you know, performing in amateur dramatic plays and all of that. That's what I'd wanted to do. I wanted to go into acting. Yeah, it's so funny. I read something recently that you'd said that something about something that you don't like is having nothing in the diary. So it's carried on. Lockdown, let me tell you, a rewiring. And I know that a lot of people, I think it was almost quite fashionable and, and, and interesting for lots of people to say, do you know, this has been great. I've really liked the space. I, I love being in the park. I was like, I did that on maternity leave, right? I walked mindlessly with my mind numbed around the park with some of the best women I've met, you know, through my NCT group. 
not detracting from that and then the need to get onto the the booze quite soon uh, when lunchtime hit and it seemed acceptable um but but i do think other people like me who perhaps are, are described in some ways as extroverts i'm not a huge extrovert in the sense of i don't i actually prefer one-to-one -one discussions probably because i'm an only child i don't adore sort of being in large groups but i don't hate it either obviously i wouldn't do what i do for a living but people like myself really we've sort of had to completely rewire and I, mm. I I found that really hard but do you feel better now things are in the diary yes you know whenever people are like find what you love and then it always leads towards like pottery or yoga or something and obviously those things are, are good for other people um uh, no no I I would actually really like to try pottery I'll just be terrible at it uh, I I think my energy is from having a meal with someone it's talking yeah. to somebody you know I know I do that for a living but I do it in a very structured way i've always got a set time and i've got to get through certain questions and while you can enjoy that it's not it's not how it is when you are in real life well and also what you do for work you research a hell of a lot before going into any conversation so although what someone gives you might be surprising you know the general gist of how that conversation's going to go or how you think it's going to go whereas actually meeting your friend you've got no idea where that conversation's going to go or what you know news and gossip they're going to reveal so there is a spontaneity that comes with those sort of friendship or those sort of conversations that doesn't necessarily come on air Yes, and I think when you are a parent, actually, you really need those timeouts with mm. your friends. You do really need, you know, we're terrible, I think, a lot of people, a lot of women, at putting those things in the diary. Often, I don't know about you, but I find myself saying to my husband, you must go out, you know, you must go and do this. And I'll think of, I'll think of something for him to do, where he can go, and he, even who he can see. Um, <laughs> and we're in the tired years, and I know, you know, we have one and, and you have a whole army, but... Um, these are the years where I think it's the rule of three, isn't it? You can only do two of the three at one time. You can do uh, the family thing and work, but not socialising necessarily. Like right. one has to go. Um, and because I work, I hate the idea that I have to lose that social bit, but it, it is the thing that has to go a lot of the time because yeah. you're so tired. Um, but yes, I'm quite regularly organising his diary as well because I like him to have a few commitments. <laughs> Well, you two met quite young, didn't you? Were you 20 when you met? I was 20, he was 21 uh, at university. And it was one of those moments I had been told and I never believed. And I know I was very young to say I never believed, but I didn't believe when people said, you know, you just know when you know. And I bloody did. And I thought, oh God, we've met so early. You know, I still <laughs> wanted to play around, play the field, meet other people. You know, I thought there was quite a few years left of that. And in a way though, it was huge fortune because that job was done. And yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I rang my uh, best friend from home from Manchester that first date in London. And I said, uh, I'm gonna marry him. <laughs> and she's like, what? I mean, he didn't feel that by the way, but I knew. <laughs> But you worked on it <laughs> and you worked around. Like, I, I, because me and Tom got together quite, we met at 13, we dated a bit, we got back together at 18. And I think there's that thing for us of whenever you talk about a future with kids, it always seems so far away. Um, so even though it's not something that you're going to tackle right now, whereas I feel like if you get together with someone in your late 20s or 30s, that is a conversation that you probably have a lot sooner was the future and what you hoped it would look like was it something that you talked about pretty early on I'm sure we did but in quite a childlike way yeah. in the sense of so it was never a question do we want children it was always yes that, that will be part of our future we hope mm. I was always very hesitant about uh, not wanting children but my ability to have them uh, yeah. which is actually really sad so um, I'm an only child not by, by design, you know, I don't want to have talked too much for my mother and, and her experience because, you know, she, I always protect other people's privacy, but she did struggle and she had issues. So I grew up knowing not everybody could have siblings and not mm -hmm. everybody could have the number of children that they might like. I definitely in, ingested that as a, as a child, not in a very negative way. I, I wasn't, people, if you say you're an only child, people always go, they, if you are listening to this and you're an only child, you'll know the face. They go, hmm. <laughs> How was that? And you, you go, hopefully, yeah, fine. I didn't know any different. And hopefully if you've got parents and a school structure around you, you'll have lots of friends and it's yeah. okay. 
it's only sad it seems for lots of other people so I grew up with that but also uh which which you know in part inspired the book I was very unwell with periods from the age of 10 and although my mum was amazing when I got my period, my, my best day of my menstrual career, I always say, uh, was the first day because there was hot chocolate, there was a fuss made, you know, welcome to the woman club, all of that. But it went rapidly downhill from there on in. And, and perhaps we'll come back to that. But mm. the reason I'm mentioning it now is I knew deep down, even though I didn't get a diagnosis for what I then learned was called endometriosis, a, a period condition, a disease. I knew something wasn't working in me. And so there was a huge nervousness in me from quite a young age that I didn't quite work yeah. and I wasn't very healthy in that gynecological sense, but I couldn't get any answers, but I certainly didn't fixate on it. And in that yeah. respect, the, although I'm very frustrated, I didn't get a diagnosis for 21 years and it made me feel like I was going mad at times. I loved that mine and my husband's twenties were unencumbered because we didn't start trying till I was 30. And that meant, even though at times I was a bit ill, I was on the pill, which actually masks the condition. So I only came off the pill when we started trying, and that's when all the issues really flared up. And I loved that actually our whole 20s were all about having fun, traveling, mm -hmm. horrible hangovers, <laughs> lots of brunches, lots of theatre, cinema, all of those things. And, and actually, you know, being completely candid, really fixating at times on our careers, you know, yeah. working really hard because I also did feel that as a woman, I was in a hurry to get a lot done before I may start the whole process of trying to have a family. Yeah. And like you say, it's that thing of, I think so many of us spend so long knowing that we don't want to get pregnant now with you know, with the pill. So I had PCOS and so I had no idea until I came off the pill that anything was was going on. You know, I had a whole year where I didn't have a period at all. And I think it's we're grown up with that sort of fear instilled in us. Don't get pregnant now. You need you know, you've got your exams, you've got your work, you know, you've got you want to get set up. And I know that that doesn't happen for everyone. But we have these usually parental voices in our ears kind of telling us what we should and shouldn't be doing. So then when it comes round to it, you, you do have that, there's that, you're meant to just have, suddenly have this switch and your body at that point, it's got to go. And when you come off your pill and your body's going, nah, you know, you don't know until you start trying. And I think it is a fear. Obviously you, you felt something else as well, but there is a fear in so many women that our bodies at that point, because we've not been going there until that point, it might fail us. So true and really well put. And also I read this really interesting book about, you know, what the pill does to you. And right. the, the reason there is no male pill, and I, I put this in my book, but I'll say what this other book said, is because every time the guys go in to be tested and they have like clinical trials on the men, they go, uh, I feel a bit ill. Can we stop this, please? And I'm like, yeah. hello, <laughs> this is how it is. You know, just go on the first pill you get often. You have to try it, feel awful, and then go on the next pill. I mean, what women, the deals we do with our bodies and hormones to not get pregnant and to have some semblance of control over our cycle, over our periods, over how we feel, yeah. it's a deal with the devil a lot of the time. Uh, and it's a very serious thing to get pregnant if you don't want to be. And that's mm -hmm. why that, that underpins that contract. But I read this brilliant book about, you know, you take the pill and to an extent you are also chemically castrated. You know, your personality can go behind a glaze. Mm. And yes, you can still be yourself. But I used to feel even on the pill that did end up agreeing with me, I was on Femidine for about 10 years. You know, it never agreed, for instance, um, with me when I was drunk. I had been a lovely drunk, even if I say so myself. And I then became <laughs> quite a terrible drunk. As in, I'd get drunk and still be fine. Yeah. But I was quite, ho I was quite horrible to those yeah. around me when it reached a certain point. Now, maybe I, you could say I was drinking too much, but these were the uni years, my early journalism years, boozy lunch. Yeah. I then later read you shouldn't be drinking a lot on that pill. Really? Yeah. So, you know... There are deals that we do, and I, I like now not being behind the fog. I'm on nothing at the moment. I'm actually very unwell again, but that's, that's a whole other story with my condition because it, right. it, it comes back and flares. But I do think, as you say, it's such an interesting thing. Like we, we sort of put ourselves in the deep freeze in a way, and then we come out. Yeah. 
So uh, when you did come out um, <laughs> from your pill <laughs> fog, um, what started happening from that point? Did your periods continue, like, will kick off? Because we all know that the periods that you have on a pill aren't necessarily a period. Did things start happening in that way at all? Can I tell you, just before I answer that, my favourite fact I learned while researching the book, uh, which was the bleed that I had been having, and many women have that. Oh, it's a fascinating book, Emma. I absolutely loved it. Yeah. No, no, and I'm not saying that to do the hard sell. I'm saying no, it's no, because no. of this one fact alone. Um, and I, I, I was on maternity leave, very stupidly writing a book. Uh, don't do that. Do not do that. <laughs> um, but but I, when I read this, essentially... When they first developed the pill in the 60s, well done to all those people who did, uh, you know, despite what I've just said, I am very grateful. It was largely developed in America. There were other places, of course. But when it was launched in America, it's a great fanfare. It was a very Catholic society and it was the 60s. So they decided so that the men didn't think their women were taking any birth control to introduce a fake bleed that is completely not necessary. The amount of times I have guilted myself, oh, shouldn't run it back to back, that's bad for me, I'm just going to have to do it there because I'm going on holiday and I want to go swimming or whatever it is, yeah. or I've got a big thing, it's fine. I mean, what I can say, because I did speak to a specialist on this, the dosage of the hormones was higher then. So women appreciated a break. Right. But there is no medical reason that you should guilt yourself, shame yourself, or feel bad. The break, even for the pill, was designed for men, by men. <laughs> anyway, you asked me a different question. I hate <laughs> it when people don't answer them. So I will return uh, after that mind-boggling interlude. Come back with any facts that you want to like feed in, because I love them. Yeah, It's a good moment to share it. Um, when I came off, at first... Start trying for a baby, actually very hopeful. Despite all my misgivings, I was trying to be optimistic. Month one, month two, month three, month four, starting to not feel great. Can remember yeah. where all those periods came. And at this point, you don't know that you have endometriosis. Don't know any problems. Um, and, you know, I always say a period when you're trying for a baby is like an email you really don't want to get in your pants. Yeah. So, you know, I remember where all of them were very painful, real signifier of, of failure in, mm -hmm. in many ways. And I know you're not meant to view it like that, but that's how I felt. Uh, month five, I think we get to month six and I say to my husband, something's not right. And the periods were getting worse. So right. this, this natural period that had been hidden for a good decade was rearing its ugly head. And so fast forward a bit, I went on a holiday uh, to, to Norway, Sweden. My mother-in-law's from Sweden. We were there with them for part of it. And I remember collapsing on a bench, just next to a bench actually in the park. I tried to sort of eat my way through the pain, cinnamon buns and coffee. And, um, and I don't normally drink coffee. I was doing anything I could, sugary coffee. And I just collapsed. And I said to my husband, I can't do it anymore. I feel like my body is dragging itself along the floor and I do not know what is wrong with me. And my friend happened to be at lunch with me a week or so later, I was still in pain. And she happens to be a gynecologist, an obstetrician, a very good one. And she said to me, Emma, sit up. And I said, I can't sit up. It's, the, it's my period. She went, what do you mean you can't sit up? I mean, I, I didn't look quite like a Roman emperor, but you know, I was sort of leaning to one side and she said, yeah. you've got to sit up. I said, I can't sit up and I cannot walk at your pace at the moment. And so I became at 31 or whatever, this hobbling old lady every time I had my period and for the 10 days up to it. And she said, I think you've got endometriosis. And she was the first person to say the word. I didn't know how to spell it. I didn't know what it meant to my huge shame. I've been a women's editor at a national newspaper. I'd heard of it a little. Didn't know anything about it. I go home, I go online and it is like a light has gone on because I fit so many of the symptoms. And they're quite hard symptoms to describe. There's been lots of studies to say, uh, it's very hard to describe pain. Mm. And women, women often don't even go to the doctors when it's to do with gynecological pain, because we sort of just think women and pain go together like bread and butter. And that is something I really want to get rid of as a, as a concept for us. Anyway, I book in to see a specialist and the rest is history. But what I would stress in terms of diagnosis and, and my friend being right, what I would stress just in case anybody worries that they've got endometriosis, which just to say is where cells um, of your womb that appear like your womb lining should leave your body, but don't, and then stick and create adhesions and scarring all over other organs and create huge amounts of pain and, and issues with fertility and other issues is you can only be diagnosed by laparoscopy, which is a keyhole 
bit of keyhole surgery. I often think it's um, it's very difficult. And I meet women and lots of women come and talk to me now, which I, which I really like. And please do continue to do so, not just with endo, with all sorts of issues. But if they come up to me about endometriosis, oh, yeah, I, th- I think I've got it. You only know if you have this procedure. And I just yeah. really want to stress that because it's a big distinction. And sadly, because there's been such a lack of research into a condition that affects one in 10 women at least, the same number as type 2 diabetes, such a paltry amount of funding has gone towards it. Sadly, we don't have a finger prick test for it or anything like that. Sadly, it has to be incredibly invasive. But that is my public health side of messaging. Yeah. I just always think is really important. And that's how, how I got diagnosed. Well, how did it feel going into that operation, knowing that hopefully on the other side, did you want an answer? Did you want it to be endometriosis just so you had a firm idea of what it was? Because otherwise, on the one hand, you know what you're facing, you know, which is great. And Because otherwise you come out and you've got no idea why you're feeling this pain. You want the problem, but you don't want the problem. Yeah. Is how you feel. Not only are you being told you've had it, you're being told you've been treated at the same time. So it's quite it's quite a lot to take. Uh, It was all over my bowel. And that part of the surgery is quite frightening because obviously if they perforate your bowel, you're going to have a load of other problems. Um, Where my luck came in was, if I can put it like that, and I know it's luck, is it wasn't in my fertility organs. Mm -hmm. So it hadn't spread into my fallopian tubes. It hadn't spread. And so uh, IVF then came into view as our way of getting pregnant. And that was really hard because I had to be told off into having it, which is often how I respond to things. Um, well, because well, also for lots of women, that first six months after having that operation, they're told they are the most fertile because everything's sort of cleared, if you like. So within that window, we, did you know that that just wasn't an option for you? We tried, sorry, we did the six months. What I would say about that is even that advice has been yeah. called into question because really? not enough data has been gathered on it. I was told exactly that. So off we went. Here we go. I mean, the last thing you feel like after your tummy's been blown up yeah. and um, lasered is going home and having lots of sex. However, I am a dutiful uh, person to the cause. <laughs> uh, and we we tried our very, very best. And it was heartbreaking that it didn't work because yeah. then I knew I was in a different saloon. And, you know, lot, I don't think we talk a lot about what it's like to have to accept to have IVF. There's a whole other bit, which I'm also very passionate about, that I'm starting to talk about now, about what it's like to work while you have IVF, because we don't really talk about that. But I did feel like it was a failure. But this amazing woman, this amazing doctor, this very cool woman with a grey ponytail, a lovely attitude, my sort of woman, I'm sure your sort of woman, said to me, um, oh, for God's sake, Emma, just try it. You've been trying for two and a half years. It hasn't worked. And do you know what? At the very best, you have a period for two months. And it was that last sentence, I kid you not, that saw me sign on the dotted line straight away. My husband's standing there going, do we not need to have a little conflab about this? I was like, no, I will take two months of hormones, not really knowing, of course, what that entailed, but I will take that over two more periods if I can get out of having them. That's how bad they were. Now I know you are one of the strongest people walking around if you're still managing to be a friend be a wife, be a mother, have a job and have your insides churning you up like a bulldozer. How did it feel going into IVF? No, you know, as soon once you said we're here, this is what we're going to do. Once the lovely lady with the grey ponytail had managed to bend her arm and, you know, convince you that this is the right way because of the two months of period. How how did it feel going into that process and what did it entail? Because for you, a massive thing was that you had to be on the road. You know, I, not many people can say, I'm going to take this chunk of time and I'm going to dedicate it. I'm going to, you know, y- you were moving around and having to make it portable. Yes. So I do. I remember she just looked at me over her glasses and said, you're not going to be doing anything stressful over the next couple of months, are you? And I looked at her. Nah. And my husband was like, you've got a general election to cover. And I was like, Yes, I do, but we're going to make that work. And, and we did. You know, there were some times where your brain, uh, quite a few times, where your brain is not how it normally is. And because at the time, my, my programme uh, on Five Live, it was the, the morning programme, it was three hours. It was a very high octane, gruelling job. You know, one minute you literally are t- interviewing the Prime Minister uh, through to the next minute, you know, covering breaking news or, or, or talking to someone who's 
stuck in a kitchen and you, you need to help them get them out and unlock them. Hello, Chrissy, if you're listening. Um, but, you know, and we did it through through a, a butter knife, I believe, and an ice cream um, <laughs> thing. Uh, that's a whole other chat. But there was a joiner called Dave who helped. But I I, my point my point was anything can happen when you're you're doing that sort of program, but you have to be on. And so yeah. when my brain was was odd, and I'm not sure I've ever talked about this before, but I reckon pre- some some people who've been pregnant can perhaps relate. Maybe you can. I used to write stuff down all the time to keep myself ahead, just mm. to keep trains of thought. Um, so there were little things I had to start to do, little adjustments to my life, to my my working life, uh, not so much to my personal life, because luckily, uh, in in one sense, it is actually quite useful. Uh, it's counterintuitive, but I didn't have anyone to look after. So I could just look after myself. So I could come mm-hmm. home, I could sleep. I wasn't caring for an elderly relative. I obviously didn't have a child, but I did not think it would work in any way, shape or form. The only time I let myself believe was straight afterwards, because what's weird is people have this acronym, PUPO, pregnant until proven otherwise. Yes, yeah. And I didn't know that then, but um, lots of reading and, and talking to people since. But you are actually pregnant there and then. You know, there is a loss with IVF that if the the test doesn't come back uh, positive, I don't think we we also acknowledge this. You obviously haven't you haven't had a miscarriage. That is different. Mm-hmm. I accept that, but you you have lost your embryo. You know, yeah. you didn't dream going into that room. And I always say this to women: it's a loss as well if it doesn't work. It's not you didn't make it up. Mm-hmm. You know, you did weeks of grueling medicine to get to that point. And then for whatever the reason, it didn't stay. So I, I always try and honour that if I talk to people, if I talk yeah. to couples who've gone through that, or women on their own or, or whatever they're in. And that's a huge thing for me when it comes to miscarriage. You know, I, I experienced that really early on before having my three. And, and that has never left me. You know, I think once you've experienced it, it, it just never goes. And it is that that hope and, and that innocence I think of walking into a pregnancy kind of going well this is great you know everything's going to be fine whereas actually if when you have a pregnancy after a miscarriage for so many people it's it's every single toilet trip it's every single twinge you won't let yourself go there because what if that pain comes back you know what if that despair comes back so yeah I, I think the more that we all talk and share about these big topics that can make you feel so alone and isolated, definitely the better. Um, What were those two weeks like from the transfer to take, did you take a test? Is that how you found out? Yes. uh, I don't really remember those two weeks. I think Commitment Carol came in and (laughs) booked every day up. Yeah. Yeah, the alter ego. And um, uh, my husband remained completely hopeful completely optimistic not sort of weirdly so but yeah he really thought this could work uh he's an odds man he loves his data and he was like the odds aren't amazing he also likes to gamble sometimes um but they're not bad as well and i went and did the test on a saturday morning at five o'clock in the morning and again i because i like to question everything i looked at this and was like why is the why is the test lying to me? As if it was somebody I was interviewing. Uh, and I was like, hang on, that. I think that says it's positive. And I took a picture of it and I sent it to the, the good friend who had you know, tried to offer a diagnosis uh, about what was going on with me. And I said, is this, is this, what's going on here? And she wrote back, you're pregnant. And, you know, it was, it was the best thing in the world. It really was. It really was. Did you run in and tell your husband at that point? He was sat on the step, on the <laughs> top step outside the loo. And he was like, I can hear you texting. <laughs> Is there any way you could tell me what's happened? <laughs> I know you like, like breaking news to other people. But it'd be quite nice to be in the loo or something like that. And I was like, I think it's happened. Um, and... You know, he, we, we just had a massive hug on the floor. And we did actually tell our parents, both sets of parents, because even though you're not meant to, I just thought, well, something's finally happened. And even if I can't keep it or whatever, um, I've responded to some treatment in a good yeah. way. 
and a very weird feeling and I know like people can say these things afterwards but we did have a couple of scares, you know, had some bleeds and I mean, one was not hilarious. One was awful, but it was hilarious because I had to go and do a, a photo shoot and an interview after being admitted to stay overnight and pre- prep on the budget for the next day. And luckily the hospital was opposite the, studio, the BBC studio in Westminster. And I went out, I said, I'm just popping out. Had all my hair done, my makeup done, came back after this interview with the Times about a new job. And this woman went, well, you look way nicer than you did when you came in before. <laughs> and I like very naughtily gone and done this thing. But I had this feeling about our son. Um, but obviously it doesn't mean anything, but it was just a strange feeling all the time. That because he'd, he'd managed to stay with me through IVF, I sort of got a feeling really wanted to stick around. Mm. It was sort of a strong, a strong person growing inside me. And I hoped he very much would. I didn't tell people necessarily. I told friends and family, of course, but I was working on a TV show for ITV at the time, um, a bit when I was six months pregnant, and I, I didn't mention it. Wore like dresses, blah blah blah. I thought, well, I don't have to say it, yeah, because I still didn't believe it was going to happen necessarily. Anyway, the sound woman just said to me, "Are we going to talk about <laughs> this?" Because obviously, sat like the mic person has to go up your dress, yeah. And I went about what, and she was like, "That you've got a baby." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah. I see. I seem to be pregnant. Seem okay. It's like a smack the pony sketch. What? What is this? So yeah, I was very. Um, and I, you know, I worked right up until the end. Uh, did you know? I was, I was so. I've, I've listened to your podcast before. I was like the bit where you ask about how they were during pregnancy, and I am. Um, you know, I know you don't always ask that, but it's part part of the discussion, and. Um, I was so well. Really? The healthiest, having been so ill for so many years, to not have periods was... Did you still have pain from endometriosis? Is that a thing? Does that just not happen in pregnancy? (gasps) Which is why it's a horrible thing, but you are told when you have endo... Yeah, try and get pregnant. They used to say that a lot um, because of that. But obviously, sod's law, it's a disease that... Stops you getting pregnant, yeah. Yeah, so you're like, oh, thanks, doctor. Uh, you know, I'm trying here. Or maybe you're 18, as some women are, and told to go get pregnant. I don't want one yet. Mm. So, you know, it's not, it's not an advice, I believe, that is given anymore. If you have received that advice, you need to tell your doctor to update. But for, for me, my experience was I was so healthy. So I wanted to go out and conquer the world. I did anything I wanted... I did all sorts, uh, socially and work. Uh, and I loved it. I absolutely loved it. And it was just, just joyous being pregnant. I'm not surprised being free of that pain as well for that period of time. No periods, free from the pain, growing a human, you know, and, and how did you feel about your body during that time? Loved it. I mean, sorry, of course I had aches and pains. Uh, and I, back to our very initial chat, I started for the first time wearing even more underwear in bed because I had to wear the... <laughs> I did wonder whether we were going to go back to knickers. Okay. Of course. Okay. <laughs> but the, um, the wireless bras, you know, yeah. to, as your boobs get bigger and obviously sleep was uncomfortable. I, I'm not, you know, ignoring those things, but they are a walk in the park yeah. compared to endometriosis. They really yeah. are. How did you feel going, like, for getting further towards the, the due date? Did you feel, you know reality was starting to sink in about what was about to happen you went for you you had you had a c-section didn't you I did have a c-section um so yeah basically everything was great until the c-section where right. uh, then I was given a baby and my stomach had been cut open um so as in very very standard me and anyone who knows me but it's also a trait amongst journalists um very last minute dot com don't con- don't confront reality or read a brief until you very much have to um You know, I signed my book deal on my tummy, essentially being wheeled into the C-section and posted it in the hospital post box. So I was like, yeah, still doing that, still doing this. And it was like, uh, and this is actually, it is really important to talk about this. It was like going from being on the motorway to not moving at all. My life, the change. Yeah, yeah. And it is, you know... It is brutal, that change. You know, obviously becoming a parent is a huge learning curve in so many different ways. 
but um, physically I took a while to get over the C-section. Some people have said because I'd not recently, not long ago, had a bit of other stomach surgery, you know, perhaps was more compounded. Right. Um, you know, breastfeeding. I mean, what is that? Like, it's so hard. Um, but I was convinced to try and do it uh, actually again because I didn't want periods. Right. That was I, I did manage to, in the end, master that. But because of the C-section, I found him hard to hold. And... Well, that's the thing. Isn't there? There's so many things, that factors that get in the way. And, and obviously, they are trying to learn at the same time. But, you know, it, it's just so many factors. And I, and I had told myself that breastfeeding was definitely what I wanted to do. And, you know, when it takes an hour and a half to feed them and then they've got to be up an hour and a half later to feed again. And the, you know, the, the, the way it affects sleep, you know, it's not easy it, for, for, for many people and and I got to three months in and I thought I would go for I told myself six months or when he had teeth uh, because to me you know I didn't want to be a bit on the nip um, but then when I got to three months and suddenly things fell into place I, I, I feel like I'd done all that work so I didn't want to just let it go um, and actually only my third child seemed to really like biting him a nipple other than that they were, they were yeah yeah but it's a journey within itself that um, you know, I think the actual practical practicalities of breastfeeding, like when you've got a C-section scar and how do you place that? How, how do you place your baby on that? And, um, you know, I think the practicalities of, of, of it are something that we maybe don't talk about as much as we should. It, it seems that the only chat about breastfeeding really is whether you do it or not. Yeah, no, I had to have like, I don't know if you've seen them, those kind of candy striper cushions. It looked like I was selling like candy, this like cushion that's went across me and um, yes it did have a pocket on the front of it and I would keep uh, treats and snacks in there lip balm <laughs> always dehydrated yeah uh, and that would be what I would put him on and then I'd put my feet on a little suitcase or a little stool so I was like that was at a better level I mean it was a whole procedure at first well it's a massive gear change and you know you you spend so much of your life focusing on you focusing on, on your career and then all of a sudden there's so much of a shift you go from a, from a place of being in control of your life and knowing what's going on to suddenly knowing absolutely nothing and then I feel like you can read all the books in the world but until your baby is in your arms that's when the journey starts because they've not read a book every book is different every parent is different and you go on this journey of kind of I don't know what I'm doing and, and making it up, trying to set, uh, take on all the advice that you hear, even though it's conflicting. Um, and it's and it's overwhelming, to say the least. You completely lose yourself. Yeah. And I think I'm still, you know, it's not just that first year. I still try to learn how to live, yeah. you know, how to how to have a good life. I think they always, you know, they, they get older and you have to catch up with. I'm always catching up with what they need or what he needs now or and trying to I think you know lockdown um l robbed me of one of my superpowers which is finding fun things to do outside mm. of the home you know uh, not just the part obviously then got inventive and you make you make things or you try and do things but you know I, I I'm trying to also introduce him to the life that we had and have and, and, and get him into some of the things that we like, whether that's the cinema, obviously seeing things that are appropriate for him. But, yeah. you know, the, all those things weren't there. So so it's been, I felt like I got on an even keel and then locked down and then coming out of that again. Uh, but equally, of course, very lucky not to have been on lockdown on my maternity leave. Yeah. You know, actually take it going away from those people who were those women who were and the men who took shared parental leave, well done you um is w what i would say is and i sort of said it a bit earlier but i do think it's a big part of this is that a lot of people have had a huge kind of awakening during lockdown about am i doing the right thing they've had existential thoughts for the first time or maybe for the first time since they've been adults about everything i mean that is maternity leave yeah you, you know you ask a guy to take eight months or a year out and i know some men do but the majority of them do not and still feel like they've got it to go back in to whatever they do, still feel like they are doing the right thing. Uh, and all of those different elements still feel like their job's going to be there for them mm. and that what they left behind, even if they didn't love it. I mean, if they didn't love it, it's even harder. It's hard. It's and I think 
the uh, one of the only silver like there's two silver linings as far as i can see about this this the pandemic in terms of our social constructs one is mainly women have been saying for years trust us to work at home yeah we can do it it takes for everybody to be at home now including men Mm -hmm. for employers to have to trust Mm -hmm. and the second thing is hopefully more people can have a bit more empathy now about what it is to go on that wild first year journey of motherhood Mm -hmm. because so many other people now not experience necessarily that but the sort of wilderness feeling of stripping yourself right back and seeing what's left yeah. and what's important, mm-hmm. it's completely full on. I mean, mat leave, for me, I, I, I remember being told about someone's friend who was making jam and uh, making cakes the whole time, and it, it just looked, it just sounded like this amazing thing. But the reality is it, of it, especially in those early weeks, which for many people, their partners go back to work after a couple of weeks and they don't see it, it's full of leaky boobs, kids crying, pain, you know, and, and actually this utter confusion as to what your life has become um what was it like for you then coming off the back of that and going back to work because you had did you have to cover the Andrew Marr show at 11 weeks yeah one of my keeping in touch days uh was that (laughs) no pressure no pressure yeah I thought keeping in touch day was literally just a phone call going Emma how are you doing (laughs) yeah I think think that's how we had to do it legally so I could do it and you know what huge respect to the guy who was running the show at the time Rob Birdley he had said before I went off on that leave, um, if Andrew, which he never does, takes a day off or has to take a day off, would love to see how you would fit in on the show. Mm. I've watched that show, geek as I am, since I was a kid, uh, when it was David Frost. And I said, I'd love to do that. And credit to him, he still asked me, even though I'd had a baby 11 weeks earlier. And I'm so happy he did, even though it was then a very weird experience and very, very hard. Um, it would have been hard anyway, because it's a it's a high octane and lots of prep and very high profile show. And mm-hmm. obviously there's way more uh, pressure. Even if you don't like your politics, you sort of know on a Sunday morning, there's political interviews on, on mm-hmm. the BBC. Uh, there's way more pressure if you're the stand in because they never ever have anyone stand in. And if you're someone who's not done it before. So there, you know, it would be all those things anyway, but to be 11 weeks postpartum, to be breastfeeding, uh, to look how you don't normally look, all these yeah. different elements, and it being the height of uh, issues around Brexit. So you've got to go and familiarise yourself with the latest uh, ramifications of what has or hasn't been said in Brussels, uh, which is not a, what you would call a story that you can, you know, coast. Yeah. Uh, all of that was quite a heady cocktail, but I decided to to do it because I hadn't died, <laughs> despite <laughs> feeling like one version of me had. Uh, and I thought, I, I think I can, so I'll try. Um, and I do think, you know, getting up that morning, you'd have to get up really early for, for a 9am programme anyway, but getting up, I think, at three to pump at the table while reading all this stuff, yeah. uh, the briefs, um, you know, was, I'll never forget sort of that sequence. And I really actually enjoyed it. I felt it was, a, even though I then didn't go back to work till... My, our son was nine months so that mm-hmm. was just it was literally a day and a day of prep um I loved it because it just gave me a really early reminder that I was still there yeah that, you know and it did go well and, and a very very odd moment just to just to say a funny thing was um I love Gogglebox and I was in obviously as I was the whole time and I am a lot now uh, on that Friday night and we were just watching it and I think I had our son on our lap you know feeding or he wasn't settling whatever and my Andrew Marr thing came on Gogglebox and it was just completely (laughs) mad because there I was back on mat leave doing the mum thing and my husband was like oh my God, I'm going to film you watching it, like live. I was like, stop it. This is so meta because I'm now watching myself and you're watching me watch myself. I can't watch this. But it was really funny because one of them was like, who's this Holly Willoughby doing, Andrew Marr? It's Holly Willoughby time. <laughs> uh, and, and then, you know, within a couple of minutes, they were all like, oh, she's a bit like one of those lions in an Attenborough documentary that sees her prey and, you know, whatever the comparison was. And then actually a couple of them like messaged me on Twitter afterwards and it was just really Aww. really nice so that did make me laugh and their commentary is just so brilliant and I love the way that show is you know put together um so it was a great thankfully it went well but it was high stakes and it was yeah. weird yeah but like you say that nice little bit of actually 
knowing that you are still there, the you that you were before. Because I always say, I say this a lot, but, you know, there's that whole thing growing up of, of worrying about changing. You know, oh, you've changed. It's always a negative thing. But you can't possibly go through so many parts of life, and motherhood is one of them, without changing. I think if you don't change, if it doesn't give you more of a sense of what goes on in the world, then something is seriously wrong. I think that's a worse thing. I think to stay stationary is worse than to have changed. Um, but it must have been a nice kind of going, well, I have changed, but that person is still there and I can and I will be able to dip back to, to her, a version of her, which is hopefully better than ever. You know, it happened and I'm, I have a very particular job. I'm really aware of that. I also am really aware that maternity leave is not something that's offered to everyone and I, I am sort of very conscious of all the different ways you know coming back to work or never having really left a lot of work uh, or even having a job to come back to plays out but just speaking from my own experience getting back on air that first week I really was like I just I want to almost kick the tires and see how my brain is you know I want to yeah. I want to push it and feel it it's just about a reclamation. It's reclaiming yourself is really yeah. important. Well, it's that thing. I think you you want to be the person that you were though. You want to commit in exactly the same way. You don't want to be made to feel lesser than. So you're going in, you know, not the same as you were. And in terms of a, of your endometriosis, how do you feel about your body now? Has it changed from coming from a place where we were talking earlier? And I think whenever you find out that something isn't quite working with your body, you, you have that sense of failure um, or that it's failed you. How do you feel towards it now? I know that it's sort of endos rearing its ugly head again. and um, But has it altered? I feel like my body and I are at war. There's a much better quote and I'm going to attribute it and borrow it. And I've had the pleasure of interviewing her and, and corresponding with her. Hilary Mantel, the, the great author, she wrote of endometriosis because it has completely, you know, been a major part of her life. And, and people, if you are suffering, it might not be for you because it's quite hard to read, but some of her writing on it is the most visceral. And she says, everything I have achieved, I have achieved in the teeth of this disease. And it was that word teeth that I was like, yeah, you're in a vice a lot of the time. I'm an impatient person anyway. I like for things to be good. I'm not, I've had to learn patience, sorry, uh, from a mother. Uh, that is a work in progress. Lots of deep <laughs> breathing should have gone to yoga. But um, I'm an impatient person for things to be good, for things to be right, because I like things to be good for people. I like to work to a high standard, all of those things. Endometriosis can make you even more impatient because you just want it to pass. You just want yeah. to get to a peaceful island for a bit. So... Um, how do I feel towards my body? Uh, I feel incredibly frustrated, incredibly frustrated. Uh, and I am trying to help it. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm exploring diet at the moment. Uh, I've just started the low FODMAP, uh, which is very restrictive. I'm seeing a little bit of the results. It's probably too soon to say, which means one of my great loves in life. Anyone who who's ever listened to me will know tea is so important to me and the first cup of tea I have a very strong I'm, I'm a northerner I need a strong brew and now I can't have milk so uh you know I'm having a weak black tea which is not quite cutting it uh I really hope perhaps I can return to that the, the mat the, the diet which by the way you must only take under medical advice sorry the BBC is so ingrained in me uh <laughs> the public service broadcaster but um it's about reintroducing things at some point so I hope I can I'm I'm trying to now take my health quite seriously. Yeah. I, I, do you reckon that's also part of being a mum? You know, suddenly that other responsibility is there. And so looking after you, although we don't give ourselves enough time at all, you realise that you want to be the best you physically so that you can have that time with your son. It's such a good point. And... I don't want to say things like I've already said, which is mummy needs to lie down or I've got a poorly tummy because they often copy you. You know, they'll say, oh, I've yeah. got a poorly tummy. And you're like, no, you're not. Um, shosh. Uh, but obviously, if you do, please tell me. Um, <laughs> so, yes, there is that. I've got a, another responsibility and reason to try and live better and do better with it. Is motherhood what you thought it would be? 
In some ways, yes, because I just wanted to give someone a lot of kisses who was really cute. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I kiss him all the time. I've come up with all sorts of games, which mean at the end, oh, guess what? Mummy has to give me a kiss. <laughs> um, so, uh, but, but most of it, no, because I just, I really hadn't been, true to my nature, last minute, all of that, I really yeah. hadn't um, engaged, hadn't dreamt about it from being a kid, just sort of saw it as part of my future, but didn't think about it. Um, so lots of it isn't like I thought, because I never thought. But quite a bit of it is also because I never engaged because I didn't yeah. want to in case it wasn't going to be my life. Mm-hmm. So lots of it is a surprise. The, the times that feel best are the times where I'm the closest to how I am normally when I do what I think is right to do. Yeah. When you reach problems that you've never met before, whether it's, I don't know, potty training, wh- whatever potty training, things that are actually, you know, requ- it's great to get advice. So I yeah. ask advice a lot. Um, I text people a lot. Uh, I think once I texted a friend with, you know, 11 questions, all quite, <laughs> all quite clearly bulleted in the WhatsApp. So that's also as well is that's brilliant because ra- you've, you've gone to someone who you trust rather than just going to Google and who knows what you might get. Oh, no, know. I've been on Google. My God, I've been on Google. <laughs> but yeah, I've, I've got a bit of an unofficial panel in my life of right. people who can uh, assist on various things. The gurus, uh, the soldiers, I like as I call them. If you could write a letter on motherhood, this is something that we do, uh, who would it be to and what would you say? I wrote a letter to myself the day before I gave birth, welcoming myself back to work, of everything I liked about my job and what I thought I was okay at. And it was called Maternity Letter to Myself, uh, to welcome myself back, because I thought, I don't know who I'm going to be on the other side of this. And I reread it the night before and I've still got it. And it was really lovely. I've completely forgotten that I did that until you've just asked really? me that question. So, um, and I don't think I've ever told anyone that. It's on my, it's, I can see it here. It's on my desktop. It's on my laptop. <laughs> um, so I probably would, in some selfish way, write something to myself. But I might write something to my niece. I might mm-hmm. write something to her. She's very young. She's only, she's only eight. But I'd quite like to send something to a younger woman. Yeah. And I would quite like to, to tell them that it would be good to know a bit more about your body and your health earlier than when you're ready to to try. I think that would be really good advice. And I would also, um, I would also advise them to, what's the phrase? Not slow down, but sort of be ready for the pace to change. I do think because especially in bigger cities like London, like Manchester, we have, we're having babies later. Yeah, I think we're living longer without children as mm-hmm. women, and that shift is quite brutal. Yeah, so I would, I, I think, we can't do this thing where girls are more um, are outperforming boys in school and university typically, and then their life comes to a grinding halt mm. when they become a mother. And I know that I've gone back and it's been okay so far, but I've just been reading Elaine Glazer's just done a book on motherhood and. Too many women are not able, they're priced out by childcare, they're, they're, they're in all sorts of situations where they cannot resume that life again. Mm-hmm. And I would try and equip her with some of the advice and lessons around that sort of topic as well, because I think some sense of self has to be retained and how one can do that is very, very important. But you can always, it's not just through your work, it's through yourself. So I was woefully ill-equipped for the psychological side of it. And I would try to write something that made a bit more sense than what I've just said to you. Well, that, I, I think when it comes to the psychological aspect of it, I think, because there's definitely that thing that you always hear, why did no one tell me it would be like this? But I think un- until you're in it... It's ineffable. You can't yeah. describe it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think I would just do that. I think that slowing down bit also might, won't make sense, but I might try to write it. Yeah. Well, it might be that one of those things that when she's in it, she reads it and she's like, yes, actually, I, I totally get that now, you know. Um, Emma, we finished the podcast. We've come to that point with you finishing three sentences. So the first one is being a mum means. Lots and lots of kisses all over my son's face, ear, tummy, knees, anywhere I can grab him and he'll let me. Since having children, I try and do yogic breathing and become a more patient person and really value a full night's sleep. 
And I'm happy when? I'm happy when my boys, my team, the two men I spend my whole life with are laughing. <laughs> and I'm laughing too. I love that. Emma, thank you so much. It's been such a lovely chat. And, and I actually listened to the audio copy of your book. Um, so I treated myself to that. And it was so good. It felt, I, I literally chuckled throughout and made notes. And it was, it was such a joy to listen to. Um, so good luck with the, public, uh, the paperbacks out now. Go, honestly, if you listen to it, if you read it, for me, it was just a massive eye opener on something that we definitely do not talk about enough. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, podcasts have played a huge part in this and you've unlocked a really important conversation. But I I definitely felt when I was starting to look into periods that women had never spoken about them to, to many people or at all. And there was this shy hunger. And, and I think with what our discussion today, there are sort of lens into women's lives that lead to lots of other conversations. Yeah. And there are sort of part of us that if we, if I do my job properly and if lots of other people are doing lots of other things to do with this space, do it properly, they should become utterly unremarkable uh, and we should be able to laugh about them as well as cry about them. So yeah. thank you very much for, for listening and, and for your feedback. You. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please go and continue to wearing your, your pants, OK? <laughs> I will. Fresh ones. Fresh ones, but still pants. 